Again, uh, good morning and welcome. Today is March 25th, and uh, we have a good topic to talk about. Thank you. And uh, the topic today is on light. I have a couple of lasers in here. This is the red light. I don't want to shine it directly on the uh, screen because if I do, it really is a bright light, especially the, oops, the blue one. I mean, the yellow one. The, I'm sorry, the green one. <laughs> so these are laser beams. We I use them for uh, experiments. This one apparently have, has a lot of frequencies because when I tried to shine it on surfaces, it did not, uh, I mean, part of it was transmitted, part of it was uh, uh, reflected, indicating that it is not of the same color, actually. It has a band of colors. Anyway, there seems to be a delay in the camera. Do you guys hear me well? Okay. Okay, good. Okay, that's fine. That's fine, team. Okay, so let's uh, share the screen in here to see where we are. First of all, let me find the uh, slide and share. Okay, so today's topic, like I said, is light. Light is one of the things that fascinated us for ever since basically we started experimenting with it. I mean, we were born with the receivers. I mean, a couple of eyes that seem to ref uh, uh, respond to it, but because when there is light, we can see, when there is no light, we can see. So it seems like there is a correlation between that and our ability to distinguish uh, shapes and distinguish colors, okay? So that is good in a sense that we have that uh, sensory system, just like, for example, with sound. We also have ears. We talked about how sound basically uh, affects the ear. It moves the ear drum a little back and forth, and there is actually a, a muscle immediately behind that that responds to the nerve, and the nerve basically sends the signal as an, uh, an electrical signal to the brain. The brain gives you a sensation of different basically frequencies, different sounds and everything like that. Light also seems to have that same uh, same same effect on us too. We have uh, uh, what we have, I mean, if you look at the eye, it has actually a lens, which is an optical device that focuses light from your surrounding and send it to the retina, okay? The retina has, uh, has, uh, has uh, I mean, like hair-like structures, but they are actually a little bit of muscles of two types. One of them detects the intensity, the other one detects the frequency of the light. And uh, both of them send, a, again, a signal to the brain and the brain give you, depending on the frequency, uh, the, the, the different colors of the spectrum that we can see. Okay, that's one thing. Depending also on the intensity of the light, it can tell you how bright or uh, dim it, the light is. So that's basically how your brain fun functions. It's a fascinating thing, both the ear and the uh, and the and the and the uh, and the eye, with the exception that we in physics and physical science in general, we really don't venture past the point where light hits the retina. After that, it's a job of biologists to get into all of those details, into the enzymes and all kinds of things that uh, that. Uh, that uh, that come into play. Well, I mean, we can understand a little bit, for example, and we can help a little, for example, when light does not really focus immediately on the retina and focus before or after, in which case you will have a short or a, a, a long eye. In that case, basically what we do, uh, we use corrective lenses okay, to help the lens that is in the retina. So if the, 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 the uh, the image is forming before the retina, we can use diverging lens to push the image back and uh, just the right amount so that it falls in the right place and everything starts to focus again. Or if the image falls behind the retina, so what we do in this case, we bring the converging lenses and we bring the image up closer again, just the right amount depending on how much correction needs to be done. And again, we have sharp images. So that's basically what optical devices are used, at least in terms of, uh, of uh, uh, in terms of the eye. Of course, we have other applications for them, like, for example, cameras, uh, telescopes, and microscopes. Those are some other devices that we use also, uh, optical devices. Anyway, we're going to talk about the electromagnetic spectrum. It turns out that light that we see is only a very, very narrow band. It, it's, it's, it goes from red 
to violet. That's all we can see. And it's a very, very, very tiny fraction of the entire spectrum. So you have red on one side as being low energy, long wavelength light versus uh, 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 violet, which is immediately above the blue, where uh, it has high energy, short wavelength. Beyond that comes the UV radiation. After that comes the X-ray radiation. And after that actually comes a little bit something else called gamma rays, okay? Shorter than this, we have the infrared, we have the microwave, and we have the radio waves and extra long radio waves on this side too. So that is basically the band that we see. This is what we, are, uh, is, uh, what we can see with our own eyes. Other animals, they have tendency to see at different ranges, okay? For example, uh, we know that dogs, for example, they have difficulty with some of the colors that we see, okay? So all our animals, they have different ways of, of uh, looking at the same spectrum. And they actually use other sensory systems than us, uh, including sound and also smell too, which is uh, different, differently developed in them. So they pick up, they say basically the molecules in the air and they can, can tell exactly who passed by and when, in which direction he or she went. So that's a very powerful stuff. We can do that. We are very blind when it comes to smell, okay? This band in here of visible light turned out to be very, very narrow, extremely narrow. I mean, I drew it in here to be big, but it is not really that big. And we'll see that. So that is basically the EM spectrum. So when you hear or read or people talk about EM spectrum, that is what they are talking about. EM is short for electromagnetic spectrum. So that is basically what you, when you're reading something and somebody is talking about EM radiation or EM spectrum or EM waves or something like that, this is what they mean with it, electromagnetic spectrum. So basically an electric field and a magnetic field working side by side to deliver this waves. On one side, you have the electric field, E field, on the other side, you have the magnetic field. Usually it's symbol for magnetism is B for magnetic field. So the B field, which is magnetic field, they travel in a direction perpendicular to both of them. Okay. They may be also, they may be spinning, they may be doing other things. So they are not really rigid in this direction is the way I drew them. But as far as the direction in which they are moving, both of them have to be perpendicular. So one of them could actually have a different, different orientation than the other one. And actually they could spin one way or the other, they could rotate, okay? One of them could be closer to the X axis if you wanna call it the X axis and the other or closer to the Y axis. If this one is closer to the X axis, the other one must be closer to the Y axis. If this one is closer to the Y axis, the other one is closer to the X axis. In other words, what I'm trying to say is they are perpendicular to one another all the time. Furthermore, they are perpendicular to the direction in which they travel. Hence, they are actually transverse waves. So light, and like sound, is not a compressional wave. It's actually a transverse wave, okay? Which gives us something that we can do with light, which is polarization. I can polarize it. I can basically eliminate all the light in all directions and keep only one direction of interest. This is exactly the role of the polarizers in the glasses. For example, when you're driving in the evening, light hits the ground, the, 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 the ground and hits all of the other directions. It becomes kind of fuzzy. You don't see well. But if you use polarizers on your glasses, your driving glasses, it eliminates all the light but keeps only one of them. In which case, you will have a better, basically, resolution. You can see better, okay? So that is the purpose of the polarizers. We can do polarization for, for, for sound because it's basically, it does not have any direction, it travels in all directions at the same time because it's compressional waves. This one is transverse, you can do it. So basically, since you can have light components in this direction, another components in this direction, another components in this direction, you have several components, but they are all perpendicular to the direction of travel. Just take a filter and eliminate everything but the one that you're interested in. And now you're in good shape because it's vector quantity.
they're in good shape. Okay, materials can absorb and can absorb or transmit light. A wall, for example, next to you, if you look at it, is actually opaque as far as visible light. It may not be opaque for other frequencies. For example, if I use infrared or even microwave, I may be able to see through the floor, uh, through, through, through the wall, okay? So the same material can be transparent for certain frequencies, but opaque for others and vice versa. So the window, for example, is a perfect example. The window is transparent for the visible light because you can see the trees outside and that is the visible light that hits our eyes. But it's not transparent for infrared light for this entire things at least uh, some frequencies in here. So meaning that the light comes in and if it's absorbed by, by us or by the, 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 the room, when it's transmitted back as heat, which is what the infrared radiation is, it's not gonna go through, it's going to bounce back. So uh, that is the essence, that is the roots of the greenhouse effect. That's what causes the greenhouse effect. So basically you have a radiation coming from the sun penetrate the atmosphere, go to the earth, absorb it by the earth, the earth warms up and emits back the radiation. When it emits it back, it does not emit it necessarily in the, in the same frequency, it emits it with a lower frequency, in which case it becomes reflected back to the ground. And now you have an amplification in that zone where you have a lot of radiation that is trapped increasing the temperature of the environment. So again, materials come in two flavors, transparent and opaque, even opaque materials they have something they call it penetration depth, basically that light can penetrate to some extent before it completely is absorbed by the material. So we're gonna talk about the interaction of light with materials, namely electrons. That's what we mean by materials. Of course, I mentioned the reflection. There is also a, a refraction, just like sound, just like any wave. When light hits materials, depending on the type of materials, depending on the surface, it may be reflected meaning that bounce back, bounce off, just like particles, just like when you take a tennis ball and you hit it against the wall. It hits the wall and come back. There is a law for that. The law for it is that the incoming angle must be equal to the outgoing angle or reflected angle. Those two, they must be the same angles. So this is the law of reflection. This would help us understand image formation, how images form. That's an important topic. That is actually a very, very important topic if you're going to be into uh, understanding these things. Also, light can be refracted too when it hits two different media or two different thicknesses, if you want to call it that way. So light travels with one speed here and travels with a different speed in here, depending on the uh, basically the constitution of the material. So when light comes in at a certain angle, it does not continue in the same direction because basically, let's say, for example, it's traveling slower in here. So it's actually tilts a little. We call this one a refraction. So this is a refraction. And this is incoming still. So in this case, light, as it goes through the medium that separates the two, it is refracted. It's broken, basically. It's not going straight as it was before. So again, this has a lot of applications. This is also important in terms of uh, uh, optical devices too, because lenses actually use this principle. Lenses use this idea, the difference between how fast light travels in here and how fast travels in here. That's what the lens is. If you think about the lens, for example, this is a converging lens, by the way. Light comes in in here from the source, from the object. It's the lens, it is refracted. So it's refracted in here and then it travels back in the medium. So it's traveling slower in the lens versus uh, outside of the lens, okay? So again, this is the law of refraction. The law of refraction involves the sign of the angles. This sign and that sign are related to how fast light travels in the two different media. 
We're going to talk about the color again. This is our perception of the frequencies. This is, again, something that has to do with the brain. And sometimes we really don't understand it very well in physics. So what we do in this case, we came up with the experimental observations. And somehow, that uh, all the colors, you can make them up just by combining three basic colors, doesn't matter which you, cha you, cha you take. You take. Uh, so which we took, we took the red, the green, and the blue as basic colors. And this is the essence of the RGB colors that are used in a lot of devices, including TVs and things like that to make all the different colors. Combine them all and you'll have the white color. And the white color is not really a frequency. That's the only one that is an exception. So white color as a frequency does not exist. It's a combination of all the colors. Black color on the other hand exists because it's a lack of this specific frequencies. It could be in here, it could be in here. Those, I'm sorry, it could be in this region or this region, okay? It appear to us dark because of the, we're gonna do an experiment hopefully to it today, okay? Then we're gonna talk about dispersion dispersion when light basically uh, with different frequencies comes in and hit the medium in here because of the frequency they're going to be broken into different frequencies and disperses basically the light okay this is like the case of prism or the case for example of a rainbow so a rainbow also is actually made up i mean the droplets of water in the in the atmosphere act as a prism but they act first of all to uh, 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 go through the refraction process and different light frequencies refract at different angles. And now reflection again from the other surface. And when the reflected light comes in and you have so many droplets in your eye, there is a combination and the combination comes in with all of those colors basically broken in the, in the air. So for this one, you really need a non same frequency light or non monochromatic light. So you need a bunch of lights. This has a lot of applications in science. This is used in spectroscopy. Spectroscopy is the science of studying basically a spectrum of light. And this tells us exactly what materials this light went through or was emitted by. So this is a powerful technique used in all kinds of branches of science, including uh, uh, application industry and application actually in society, for example, in uh, criminology, where people, where people go and study what, what materials are in here and there to trace back some things or some materials and things like that. So this is a very important branch of, uh, of uh, science, which is really, uh, it has to do with how light basically interacts with matter, okay? Again, I mentioned briefly polarization when I was talking about this EM waves and the fact that they have this preferred directions that we can use that to, 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 uh, to, for our advantage basically for some applications. So this is the, imp uh, the introduction to the chapter. So let's get going. So again, light, electromagnetic created by vibra vibrations of electric charges having frequencies that fall within the range of sight. Okay. So you have to have a charge to really create a uh, light. Okay. So you have to have a charge, typically an electron actually, going up and down. Okay. In doing so, a charge will create an electric field. So now you have an E field that is created by it. Charge in motion also, which is a current, create a magnetic field. Now you also have a magnetic field. After the charge creates this, now they are separate from it. Now, according to the electromagnetic theory, both of these fields now, because they depend on time, because the charge that created them is time dependent, it's motion, then they self-sustain one another. So basically an electric field, will generate a magnetic field, which will generate an electric field, which will generate a magnetic field, all the way from the source, or be it the sun or the another star, which is very, very far away from us, uh, until it comes to here with this self-sustained, basically electric, magnetic, electric, magnetic, traveling in vacuum, actually. They don't even need material to come. So that's in a sense what the electric field, what the electromagnetic waves are. That's why you need both. Because if you all create an electric field, if you all do create an electric field by itself, that is not time dependent, because if it's time dependent, it's going to have its own magnetic field. If this is constant, if you take a charge and nail it, bring some nails and hammer and everything else and put it in place, it's not moving. So it's gonna create an electric field around it, but that electric field will do nothing. It's not gonna carry with it light, it's not gonna carry with it a wave, it's not gonna be doing anything for you. 
So you really need a time varying phenomenon in here for the electric field to generate its own magnetic field, which now since it's time dependent will create its own electric field, which now will create its magnetic field and so on and so forth, okay? So this is basically how this phenomenon, frequency of vibration electrons equal to the frequency of light. So how fast this electrons move up and down will determine the frequency of light, which is really very important. If I'm going to send, for example, build an antenna or I'm going to send, an, uh, send a signal somewhere else using these waves, then I have to be careful in here to choose the speed of these charges exactly so that it gives me that frequency that I want to communicate. With. Let's say, for example, both of us, we agree that we're going to work with radio waves, okay? Something like a gigahertz, okay? Like your phone is probably five gigahertz. Let's say, for example, I want to send a five gigahertz. That means I have to make sure that these electrons in my antenna are moving with that frequency. Once they do that, then I am sure that they, uh, they have a five gigahertz signal. So that, that is important. Of course, there is another issue in here, and that is the intensity because light spreads in a, in a big sphere also, albeit transverse waves, it's going to diminish, it's going to weaken with time. If you take a candle, for example, and light it next to you, it looks beautiful, you can see with it. Move it a few yards away and it's going to hardly, you can hardly see anything if it's the only source of light with it. Move it a mile away and you're not gonna see anything. You're not going to even see the candle because again, the candle is still the same. It's giving the same light as before. It's still giving the same radiation as before. The charges that are in the plasma, which is the fire, are moving super fast back and forth and creating that light that spreads away from it. Whether it's close from you or a mile away from you, it's still the same candle, but in one point you don't see it and in the other you see it, but I mean, you see with it and the other one you don't because of the fact that light spreads all around. So now you really have to have a very, very powerful candle the signal has to also have high intensity if you expect it to reach someone else. Obviously, my eye will probably not be able to see the candle, but if I have a very high sensitive device in here, it may pick up that uh, light after all, albeit super weak. If I have the frequency properly tuned, if I have a frequency properly tuned, I will pick up that frequency. What I need to do then in order to decipher that signal and come up with an image with it is that I have to amplify the signal make it bigger. And that's exactly what your cell phone does, by the way. The cell phone has an antenna that is tuned to the, to this, to the, to the, uh, to, to the tower. So in this case, what it does is picks up that signal and amplifies it for, it, for you, okay? Once it amplifies it, then it does all the things with it in order to give you that sound, uh, that sound that you hear in the, uh, in the speaker of the uh, micro and the speaker of the telephone. So it travels near a million times faster than sound, of course. Sound travels around 340 meters per second. Light travels 300 million meters per second. Okay? So it's almost a million times bigger than that one. So it's actually the fastest thing there is. There is nothing. So this is actually ceiling when it comes to speeds. Okay? Nothing travels faster than light. Not only that, nothing travels as fast as light with the exception of light itself, okay? Or particles that don't have mass, they do that too. Like for example, gravity waves, they travel at the speed of light because they really don't have mass too. So if you don't have mass, and this limitation is coming actually from another theory in physics, namely relativity, and we're gonna talk about that one at some point, okay? So again, this is the speed of light, 300 millions meter per second. Usually you hear people talking about in kilometers per second, and they say it's 300,000 kilometer per second. This would be 0.3 kilometers per second, third of a kilometer per second for a sound, which is fast. Imagine three kilometers in every, I mean, three, uh, in, in every second you cover three kilometers in here, or a little uh, over three kilometers in here. No, I'm sorry, third of a kilometer. In three seconds, you can cover a kilometer. I'm doing the math backward. And in here, in just say, that same second, you cover 300,000 kilometers. 300,000 kilometers, it's a lot of number, isn't it? I mean, if you can think about it, the distance from you, where you're sitting right now, and if you travel the entire radius of the, uh, the entire circumference of the Earth, 
If you walk from where you are, never stop. Okay, never turn left or right. I mean, provided you can walk on water and the mountains and everything else, okay? And just face the same direction. Never turn left or right. Just go in the same direction and come back to where you were sitting earlier. That's only about 40,000 kilometers. It's only about this much. Okay? So you still have 40, I'm sorry. You still have about 10 times more to go. So doing the circumference of the Earth almost 10 times in one second. We're not talking about the year or three years or you're given 12 years to complete this trip in one second. Okay, that's how fast life is. So light and all EM waves travel are transverse waves. I already mentioned that in the intro, the fact that they are transverse. Okay, so light. And all the EM waves, the entire spectrum actually, are of this type. They are transverse waves. Okay. So here, this is how they look like. So on one side, the red one in here is the electric field. The blue one in here is uh, the, the magnetic field. And they work together. You cannot have one without the other. That's why the world now, in the old days, you have electricity and magnetism. But now you cannot really call them that. You have to call them electromagnetic waves. They are actually one thing. So these two that you look them, they look separated by color and space and all of that. They are actually two sides to the same coin. On one side, you have the electric field. On the other side, you have the magnetic field. Okay, albeit in here they're perpendicular actually. <laughs> this coin need to be reshaped. Okay, so this coin probably is better to draw it this way. Okay, so it's the same coin. Okay, so that is because they are perpendicular at any given point, these two are perpendicular to one another. At any given point, these two are perpendicular to one another. Whether it doesn't matter where you pick them up, they're perpendicular. As a matter of fact, they are also perpendicular to where they are traveling. So this is the direction that they are traveling, and both of them are perpendicular to it, hence transverse. What controls this creation and destruction of these two fields in the empty space is this law, the law of induction, okay? The electromagnetic induction, okay? The electric field creates a magnetic field because it's varying in space. This depends on time depends on T, time. And this too depends on time. Because B now is created that depends on time because what created it depends on time, that too will create an electric field, which in turn creates a magnetic field, which in turn creates a B field. You know where this is headed, don't you? I'm sorry, an E field, okay? You know where this is headed, okay? It starts from a star and this process continues all the way to your eyes, okay? And it could have started billions of years ago from the faraway galaxies that are sitting about 13 billion years ago from, from here, 13 billion years ago, or 13 billion light years in space. They sent this light, which does this. An electric field creates a magnetic field, which creates an electric field, which creates a magnetic field, which creates an electric field, and the process continues. Until the point where they hit your eye, at that point, there is a different story happening, okay? The electrons in your eye, they respond better to the electric field than the magnetic field. Why? Because the magnetic field is super weak, relatively speaking, in the same units than the magnetic field. As a matter of fact, it's smaller by this factor, by 300 million factor. That's why your eyes are more sensitive, actually, to... Uh, to the electric field that hits them than the magnetic, although both of them are there. Okay, both of them are there. But the electric field is more, has more effect on the electrons in your eye than the other one, in which case that's fine. You have the electrons now moving back and forth. They send a signal, so there is no problem. Now you have an electric signal that is wired up in your nerve system that goes from the starting point in your eye all the way to your brain. That's fine, no problem, okay? So that's, so that, that does not mean anything, the fact that the magnetic field is uh, 300 million times smaller than the, magnetic, than the electric field. Both of them, actually, if you do the math, 
they carry the same amount of energy. As a matter of fact, if one of them is missing, it doesn't matter which, you're gone, you're done. You don't have uh, light anymore, it's destroyed, okay? You need the other one, both of them, like I was saying, two sides of the same coin, with the exception that this coin has this shape, okay? Not, not that flat coin that we are used to it. Here is what I was talking about in the beginning when I was talking about the spectrum. This is the EM spectrum. What I mean by the EM spectrum, this entire thing, although I don't want to I really erase this thing. Everything is the EM spectrum. The visible light is in here. So it starts with the red. That has, we're looking at it in terms of increasing uh, frequencies. The frequency in here is about 100 hertz, then uh, about 10,000, then 1 million. Then you have here about 100 million. And here you have 10 billion hertz. And in here you have a trillion hertz, okay? And at this point, you have numbers that I don't even know how to say, okay? You have 10,000 billion, uh, a trillion, I'm sorry, hertz. And at this point, you have so many numbers in here that is unbelievable. See how big the numbers are? From 100 hertz all the way to 10 to the power 24 for the super energetic gamma rays, okay? Gamma rays are super, super energetic because of this thing. This is the direction of the energy and the frequency. So this is frequency increasing and energy in the same time. Both of them increase in this direction. The wavelength is actually the opposite. The wavelength is longer this one, this way. The wavelength longer. It's in this direction that is longer. You can, can clearly see in here the separation between one crest and one crest is of the order of a kilometer in this point. To about a meter to about, uh, what is it? 10 to the power six nanometers, which is what? Uh, about a millimeter, okay? To about micrometer. This is the size of microbes actually. Then you have few hundred basically nanometers. This is actually the red is about 700 nanometer. N stands for nano. Nano is 10 to the negative nine. This is 700 times 10 to the negative nine. It's uh, about a few uh, basically uh, fractions of a micrometer basically, that's all. And uh, all the way to uh, the violet, the violet is about 400 basically. I mean, it's a little less than that, but we usually take 400 nanometer. So of course this one is shorter because we're going this way now, okay? So in this direction is the direction of increase energy this is long wavelength, this is short wavelength, okay? High frequency, more energy. Low frequency, low energy, okay? So for us, the, we see anything between 700 to about 400 nanometers. In terms of uh, wavelength, I mean, in terms of frequency, it's, it's between 40, what is it, trillion Hertz to about 70 trillion Hertz. So the range is very, very narrow actually compared to this range. Actually, this is an exaggeration, it's big time. If you look at it more practically and you have it on this scale, it's hardly going to be a line in there. How did we evolve to do this? I don't know. It probably has to do with the way that sun emits lights. Sun is peaked around these frequencies. That is basically what we know for a fact. So there is a correlation between what we have available on earth from the sun and what we can see. So this is basically the visible light. All of this light of the spectrum is here. The sun peaks around this frequency, around the green actually. But if you look at the sun today, you're not gonna see it green. Please be careful if you do that, okay? It can be damaging to your eyes. So you have to use a proper uh, glasses for it. It's not gonna be green because all of the other colors are gonna come to this one mix in here they have actually equal, almost equal contributions and it appears white actually in the sun to us. Other stars, they can emit in this range and they appear yellow. Other stars that have low frequency, they have low temperature, they emit actually in the, in the red, okay? Some of them are actually, they're not even in the visible zone. You cannot even see them. 
some stars actually appear blue. And the brightest of them all, the strongest with the highest temperatures still appear blue, even though they are probably in the violet region because blue in this case dominates that. And that's basically how the range of stars they look like, okay? Uh, so this is basically what we have. Then, of course, we have after the infrared comes the UV radiation. Now we're talking about high energies. This is high frequency, high energies. This can be damaging. This can cause problems. This one interacts with your molecules of your skin and give you that feel of warmth. That's what your heat is. That's why you have the, the, the microwave cooks in that region. It uses, takes advantage of that because you send a microwave uh, radiation to your food, to your soup, to your water, which is mainly your food. Then the water starts to agitate because the agitation is here at the molecular level and it's of the order of basically a few millimeters, okay? That's why the microwave works in this one. Your remote control works in here. Your, 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 your uh, what is it? Your uh, signal also works in here for your uh, telephone in this region, okay? So a lot of these things are used in uh, practical reason. So that nonsense stuff about, uh, what is it? 5G causing Corona has no basis whatsoever because viruses actually, <laughs> Uh, they cannot, I don't know, I'm, I have no idea how that is coming, because if you go in terms of the intensity of energy, UV can cause a lot of damage. UV is actually on the molecular level, actually, I'm sorry, on the atomic level. So in this case, it's really super energetic. Then you have X-rays, which are far more energy and far more damaging. But of course, if you have short bursts of them, that doesn't do a lot of damage. And then you have, of course, the gamma rays, which are supposed to be even stronger. What are we doing on time? We still have good time. So the EM spectrum spans waves ranging from lowest to highest frequency. The smallest portion of the spectrum is, it's not radio waves for sure. That's a big wide region that does not have actually have a lower limit. It's not gamma rays because gamma rays here, theoretically they are also, we don't know exactly their limit right now, okay? It's not microwave because the microwave is actually a lot of frequencies. So the only thing that we are left with is, so that is actually a very narrow band. Okay, very it's much narrower than this actually. I mean, this is an exaggeration just to show the colors because if we really try to draw it, we're gonna draw a line in there. So the order of increasing frequency, uh, increasing frequency, okay? Red has less frequency than violet, which has less frequency than UV radiation, which has um, less frequency than X-rays and gamma rays has the highest frequency. So this is high frequency energetic, energetic, short, wavelengths, okay? Comparatively speaking, this is actually low frequency, less energetic, less energy, and longer wavelength, okay? And you go in this order, in all of these words, okay? in all of these uh, words. Here's what I was talking about earlier about the opaque and transparent materials. Glass actually uh, uh, is, uh, for the visible light, it's going to be a transmitter. It's opaque actually for the UV radiation too. And it's opaque also for the infrared. So glass has this property that it does not transmit infrared. It does not transmit. That's why it's very, very dangerous to leave an animal, for example, in the car uh, when it's uh, sunny outside, even at not too hot day, because there is a lot of sun, a lot of radiation that come from the visible light goes in. Now it's absorbed by all the materials in the car, including the leather, including the dog himself or the cat himself, herself, or whatever other stuff that is in there, and then transmitted back. When it's transmitted back, it's opaque. It's going to bounce back. So now there is a net income of energy and nothing is going out. Actually, the, the, the infrared I was talking about, that's actually the microwave is actually heat. So there is an increase in temperature in here. 
in, in, inside the glass, inside the protected zone. And this is actually the essence of the greenhouse effect. This is why we have the greenhouse effect. This is actually the greenhouse effect. We use this one, for example, in agriculture to trap heat in the, in the, in the winter in, in, uh, in places where we want heat to exist and radiation to provide us, for example, with the food that we grow. So this is actually a very good thing at some point. But for our entire planet, that is not actually a good thing. That's a bad thing, okay? Because the temperature will rise and that cause all kinds of problems on, the, on, the, in the, in, on Earth, okay? Venus, case in point, which is really the temperature there is nothing can survive. Actually, all the oceans have evaporated and Venus lost its atmosphere. And it's basically the worst place on, in the solar system right now. Anyway. So So again in this case we're talking about the transparency and the observer absorption of light what how how is it caused it's similar in a sense to uh, what for example I know I did not I only had one of this I didn't have two of them tuning forks. I don't know. I used to have another one, but I don't know what it is. Uh, you can have resonance between them, basically. And that's exactly what's going on in here in this case, too. That is exactly if light hits uh, uh, electrons that have their own proper uh, frequency, they are going to be in resonance. And that's exactly how you receive and send signals, because that's... Uh, using resonance, the phenomenon of resonance. That's how you do tuning also. And this is basically how light is transmitted through materials. Light is absorbed by uh, uh, the electrons of a, of a molecule. Then that molecule will vibrate, will, will be excited actually at a higher energy level. Then uh, it's going to transmit it to go back to its basically ground state. When it does that, light between absorptions is actually traveling with still the same speed of light. But the while it's being actually uh, absorbed at that point is going to uh, while it's being absorbed at the time, it's not traveling anymore. That's why it appears it's moving slower. So and then until it gets all the way to the other end. So this is actually the uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, for the transmitting materials for the materials that are not that are transparent, not opaque. For an opaque material, basically, light is absorbed, and it's emitted actually in different frequencies in here. So by the time it's absorbed again, it does not really go any further because light is going to be. Uh, it's going to go less and less in intensity by the time at the end it's not going to appear from the other side. So uh, in that case, it has what is known as uh, penetration depth, where it's going to basically after which it's not going to be absorbed. Like for example, the case of the wall I was talking about, that is actually a good case of an opaque material for, uh, for visible light. Okay, again, average speed of light through materials. For vacuum, because you don't have this process going on, you don't have this absorption, and then re-emission. So what's going on in this case, light travels with the fastest speed possible, 300 million meters per second. In the atmosphere, there is a lot of molecules in the atmosphere, but they are far spaced. So this phenomenon happens, but not at that rate. So in other words, in the atmosphere, we have practically also 300 million meters per second. In water, though, it drops by because the water molecules absorb it and they emit it and absorb it and emit it. So it travels with three quarters of uh, the speed of light. In glass, I'm sorry, yeah, in glass about two thirds and in diamond 0.41, depending on how opaque the material is, okay? So it's gonna be transmitted still, but it's transmitted with less than the speed of light, okay? The law of reflection, again, I mentioned that before, is the one that has to do with the incident ray and the reflected ray. That depends on two things, depends on the material itself and depends on how smooth the surface is, okay? So if you look at your glass, for example, and I mean your mirror, for example, it's made up of a, of a glass, and then usually there is a metal behind it that is actually a reflective metal because the glass itself is transparent. So you send the light comes in, then it's reflected back and it obeys this law. So if you look at the mirror, this is a flat mirror, by the way, because mirrors, they come in three different kinds. There is a flat mirror, then there is a concave mirror, and there is a convex mirror. I mean, I'm trying to show it to my uh, side. So this is your convex mirror, I mean, concave mirror, 
and this is your convex mirror, and then you have the flat mirror that is used in a lot of industry. So and again, when you look at the side in here, when you look at your hand, for example, this is how the, the law of reflection works in here. So you look, you see the reflection of your hand coming to your eye. For you, it looks like the, uh, this, uh, this image is coming from here, which is an illusion, not a real thing. If you look, for example, to your leg again, you look in here, this is the leg. For you, it appears the light is coming from here. This way, you're going to make a replica of the image in front, and you will have a perfect. If you go straight out to look at your eye, the light comes bounces back because the angle of incidence in that case is 90 degrees and the angle of reflection, I'm, I'm sorry, it's zero degrees, and the angle of reflection is zero degrees at that point. So it appears that the, uh, the, there is an eye on the other side looking at you, okay? So this is how the image is formed. So this is the image formation. And that's exactly what I was talking about. So this is called an, an object. This is called an image. I'm sorry, it's already written there. So this is an object, this is an image. The, the image is upright, meaning the eye looks up and everything. So this is, this is important. Also, the magnification in this case is one, meaning that the size of the object and the uh, and size of the object and the image are equal. This is true only for flat mirrors. For different kinds of mirrors, this is not true anymore. The, the image could be inverted. So in this case, it's upright. And it's equal in size to the other one because this distance and this distance are the same. This distance, doesn't matter which point you take, are the same. So the location of the image is the same as the location of the object from the mirror, okay? There is another thing on here also. So this is a magnification one. Magnification is equal to one. Furthermore, this is actually a virtual image. What do I mean by that? If I take a film, for example, to the other side of the mirror and expose the film for a fraction of a second, Nothing will develop in it because there is no image in here. Okay. Whereas if I have the image come on this side, it's going to be a real image. So there are times where I can form real images. There are times where I can form virtual images. Your camera really forms a real image that is actually formed on your. The same thing is what happened with your retina. That is actually something you can develop at the end. You can actually burn on a on a film or a, on an an LCD screen or what is it to, to produce an image out of it. But this one is actually a virtual image, not a real image. As a matter of fact, just pick around the, behind the mirror and you will not see another person standing in front of you, okay? You guys know that, don't you? Okay. I'm glad that you guys know that. I mean, you didn't learn this one today. <laughs> yeah. There is one thing that is actually not uh, working actually for images in this case, and that is left and right. That seems to be violated when this image formation is. It seems like left becomes right and right becomes left. That is the only thing that is kind of strange. Other than up and down, it's uh, conserved, but left and right is, is not conserved. And this is actually true also for the Zoom sessions, because the camera sometimes can be... Uh, I'm talking about my right hand, and probably every one of you is looking at my left hand, thinking that I... He's a left-handed, but no, okay? <laughs> so, so again, this is basically what I was talking about in here. This is exactly what, uh, so not only the axis reverse in an image is the front back axis, okay? This is basically what they're talking about. Now, this is convex mirrors and concave mirrors, okay? Again, the shading in here will determine the, sh the, the side of the mirror. Is it, in this case, convex? or is it in this case concave? So in this case, clearly the sizes are not the same. And the location of the image is different. And that's what you read when you see the sign on your, the mirror of your car when you're driving that objects are closer than what they appear because it pushes the, the image a little bit further to make, give you a wider, basically angle, wider view of, uh, so that you can see more. 
but actually the objects are closer than what they are because again things like this one can be sometimes misleading it makes the object look smaller for you in your head the way your brain interprets a smaller image because you know normally how people they are how big they are you know normally how big a truck is truck has this much size and you look at it in the mirror and it's a tiny truck so you think that hey it's very far away because it's small because that's what you're used to this is a cultural bias when you look at the the road for example a far away you see truck that is very small so you know that it is very far but when you look at it in the mirror you may assume the same thing because again you think that hey it's small so it's very far let me just make the change my lane but actually it's closer than what they appear. And here it's the opposite. Okay? It gives you the impression that this thing is going to really ram onto you, but it's actually because again, doing it in the opposite direction, okay? So now you can use these things for, uh, for, for other practical applications. For example, if you want to magnify images or focus images, depending on how you want, what you really have in mind. That's why we use these devices in optical instruments, like for example, uh, microscopes and telescopes. Actually, telescopes use reflected mirrors like this one, okay? To produce, to focus the image into one point and then bring it back. And now you use actually lenses to look at the star or the moon or whatever you're looking at. Okay. Diffuse reflection when the surface is not smooth, the law of reflection is still applicable in a sense that the incoming and the uh, and the outgoing, they always have equal angles. This angle and this angle are equal. Now this one, because it's tilted differently, this angle and this angle are still equal. So in this case, it's still uh, true, okay? Let me check here quickly something. So this law is still true. So in the sense that the angle of incidence and the angle of reflection are true. By the way, I forgot to where this light is in here. Is it this one? Yeah, it looks like it's this one. So this is the incoming and this is the, uh, this is the incoming and this is the reflected. So in this case, light appears to go every which way and it's diffused, okay? So there is less focus in here and uh, it's not good. So if we're gonna build a Hubble telescope or telescope of a uh, for practical uses, when you want the beams to be focused into a specific point, you have to make sure you spend a lot of time basically polishing the surface. And that's actually one of the reasons why those devices are super expensive. And you don't want anything to basically pollute them, even a piece of hair can cause a lot of damage. So again, they are used, for example, for this one is probably is a very, very big antenna. It's used for long wavelength. So this must be a radio waves you see how the size of it this is typically this is the size of a building which is probably about five ten meters high so this is about 10 meters about 20 meters so if i look back into my spectrum in here this antenna is useful for stuff of this order here in this region so it's for radio waves it cannot be for this waves okay because well, that's too small. The telephone, if you open your telephone in the back, you will see an antenna laying behind in there. That is actually very small. So that is actually for wavelengths of this size. Okay. What is it? The 10 to the, here. This is the range, 10 to the power 9. And this size, okay. Which is of the order of a micrometers and, no, millimeter, okay. So if you open your antenna, you, I mean your phone, you will see actually, oops, did I turn on the light? Oh no, I don't know how to turn it off. I don't know how to do that, sorry about that. Okay, let me turn it off from here. Anyway, the point being in here is the size also determines actually the frequency. So when you look at uh, 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 devices like this one, you can actually tell the frequency that is used in here, okay? comes in, focus, comes in, focus, and then it comes in in here, and then it's transmitted and amplified in here, and we do all kinds of things to analyze the data. So again, the refraction is a different phenomenon, okay? I was talking about how speed, how the speed of light is traveling with different uh, speeds between different media. So this is the angle of incidence and this is the refraction. 
again, that can, uh, there is actually a law that involves the signs. This is one of the few experiments that were conducted by the Greeks, actually. This is a fun experiment, and I was going, planning on doing it today, and that's why actually I brought my cup in here, except that I couldn't really get the camera to focus on it, okay? So basically what we used to do with this in class is we take a, a cup like this one, which usually uses a styrofoam, we put a coin inside, and then uh, you look at it from a distance and you see no coin. And as you start putting the water in, all of a sudden the score of the coin starts to appear. So again, it appears that it's coming from the other side, but it's because of the refraction of the light, okay? So this is actually a fun thing to do in class. I can't wait for next semester when they're saying that this class is going to be on campus. That means we can do this in class. Again, this is true also for the fish. For some reason, birds of that, that catch fish, they come straight out and they know about the refraction, they don't fish in it in the wrong place. If you try to capture it in here, there is nothing. That's actually an illusion, optical illusion. The fish is actually here, okay? So that's why, and for some reason, birds will go straight into it and know about this refraction and grab their fish from there. And this is basically also what happened in the evening. So by the time you're looking at the sun and you think that it's still in the horizon, and actually what you're looking at is a refracted beam of it. It's already below horizon. Okay, so it's already gone. And same thing in the morning, it gives you that same impression that it's already uh, above the horizon, but it's not, it's still below horizon. So again, that's because of refraction, okay, in the atmosphere. And this is also the same reason what basically give you that impression that you're looking at the reflection of the, of the atmosphere in here as some sort of water, and this is basically the mirage, okay. Color is something that is basically on how our brains basically interpret those frequencies. And uh, when we add frequencies, when we add different colors, basically shades of colors, we get a different impression of a different color. And this is a branch by itself, basically. And that has to do with how we interpret, how our brains interpret colors or lack thereof, okay? So an object in this case will appear blue because it transmits, it absorbs everything but blue, okay? It appears green if it does that too. So what I have in here, here, I have a, I was talking to you about this one. What light is this one? So this is the green light, so it's fine. It's going to be absorbed partially by this material in here. Oops, so let me make sure I have it focused in here. If you see the dot on my neck in here, this is without, this is with, this is without, this is with. Again, I'm absorbing a lot of this material, absorbs a lot of light in here so that you don't see it in there. Very good. So if I take another material in here, okay, the red one probably. This two combined now, so basically that's what I have in here. Again, You can't see the light anymore. Here is the light, by the way. You can't see it because it's all absorbed now. The entire green is absorbed. You can see it only on the material by itself, and that's the end of it. So it's supposed to go into my neck in here the way it's supposed to work. To work. Let's experiment with another one. This is the red one. When my shirt that is red today, it's hard to do. Again. When I put this one in between it, it's going to be for the most part gone, okay? Actually, you don't see it much because it's absorbing it. This material absorbs everything except this color. That's why you're seeing it that way. So the red one does not penetrate through it at all. It's all absorbed in here. So that's how we perceive colors again because of the way that the materials interact with them. So if you look at something and it looks red, it's because it's absorbing everything but that frequency. If it looks white to you, it's reflecting everything, okay? So that is the item of discussion today on how materials reflect light, reflect light.
why desert dwellers were mainly light, mainly white, mainly white. Why do you think they do that? What do you guys think? Is it the net reflector? Air it net reflector. Yeah, they reflect mainly light, okay? All the light, so they appear white for us. So they basically don't retain a lot of uh, lights because this one that absorbs all of the other lights will that will cause its energy to increase. Okay. So again, when you mix colors, you're going to have different uh, appearance of different shades in here. For example, when I mix the different colors in here, red plus blue is magenta. Where is red and blue? It gives you this magenta. Red and green. Red and green give you the yellow color. Now red, I'm sorry, uh, green and blue will give you the cyan color. And when you mix them all, it gives you that white color. Again, this is how we interpret colors ourselves. So the primary colors can be also, or these are the primary colors, RGB. Then also the opposite to that is the magenta, cyan, and yellow which uh, with the black, that is what, used, uh, what is used actually in, in the industry, in the printing industry. So they use this one, they don't use this primary one. However, in the, in the, uh, in the uh, because then it can reproduce, if you mix them, you can reproduce the primary colors and give you beautiful pictures. So in the print industry, they use this one. They use the opposites. In, in cameras, I can't see the chat, somebody's. Okay, that's fine. So basically, uh, in addition with the color with the black color, that's what we use in the industry. Again, we were talking about the dispersion before. And dispersion is if you have white light, which is a combination of all of the frequencies, by the way, white light does not exist. It's only the combination of all of the other colors. So again, red is reflected because it has a longer wavelength versus that of the blue, which is sharply reflected in this case, and you'd have a separation of the color. This is how basically you end up with that different spectrum. This is used actually in the diffraction grading. Okay. Because this one has, I think, I suspect has a lot of lights. Oh, no, no, this one. This one. A lot of frequencies. And this is a diffraction grading. I don't know if you can see the different colors forming or not. I don't want it to go to the camera, actually. Yeah, you really have to do this in class to appreciate this, OK? You can't really do it in here. So this one is how many li lines? 1,000 lines per millimeter, OK? Let me see if I can. No, it's still green. Because this is mainly a main frequency. But if I have a shine light, that is, uh, and I have to do this one, actually. We have to do it in dark. If I have really white light, you will see the spectrum form. Okay, and we do this in the class too. Okay. With the prism, we do it actually in the class, and it looks very nice too. What is it, my prism in here? I don't know what happened to it. And this is actually the same pr principle behind the formation of rainbows. Okay. So this is something that you probably have experienced in person, and this is actually something that is. So what you have, you have two droplets of water in this case next to one another. So uh, uh, violet will, uh, because of the way that it reflects in this case, will have about 40 degrees, red 42 degrees. And now when you combine these two in your eye, you will see a clear separation between these two frequencies, OK? And you see it only in one direction. You don't see it in the other direction, unless it's a double rainbow, in which case it's going to be um, uh, uh, inverted. So what's going on in here, you have a refraction followed by a reflection by another refraction again between the two media, which brings it slightly back, but then that is fully separated now, okay? So you have some conditions for it. You have to be really in the correct location to see the rainbow, okay? Yeah, so that the lights are back because if you move around back and forth, you're not gonna be able to see it. 
here is a rainbow. And if you look up close in here, there is actually another one, which is a secondary rainbow, where the colors are actually backward, okay? The colors are actually, the red follows all the way to the blue light in there, okay? So this is an example of a double rainbow. I mentioned polarization earlier because of the fact that light has electric field and magnetic field and our eyes respond better to the electric field. So if we can isolate the direction for an electric field, then that is how polarizers work. Otherwise light itself can be in all kinds of directions. It can be actually spherically polarized, meaning the X component and the Y components of the electric field rotate around one another in a sphere or actually uh, 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 elliptically polarized in a sense when of them is stronger than the other one. So in this case, it has a stronger direction more than the other, but it's still polarized. And it has all kinds of uh, phenomena. But if I run it through a polarizer, and we used to do this experiment in class too, you will see that the light is going to only go in one direction. If you take it, another polarizer, they cancel each other and you will not see light at all coming through from the other side, okay? Sound does not do this. You cannot polarize sound. Okay. So this is basically what I was talking about, the, the vibration of the electric field in every which way coming at you. But now if you eliminate all directions and only one, that means that is how you polarize. So here is the deal. You have radiation coming from all directions. And when you run it through a polarizer at that point, now you have the light that is in only one direction. If you run it through another polarizer that is actually parallel to the first one, you still are not going to gain much because you're going, you gained already what you need to gain from the first one. Now, if you put it backward though, there is no light they're going to go through, okay? And this is an example of what's going on in here. And this is the experiment we used to do in the class, okay? Note in here when they are reinforcing one another, uh, the image still appears from the back in here. In here, they cancel out completely. Okay, and this is basically when there is a components only. So when you choose some directions and you have some light in here, polarization. Okay, this is the entire chapter. I know we have some time in here, but uh, I will see you guys on, I know this chapter was kind of light and a little bit fun. I'll see you guys next week on Tuesday. Professor? Yes. <laughs> So it was just that one item of discussion about, okay. Yeah, yeah, about the uh, the reflection of lights and basically how it's uh, uh, the desert dwellers and things like that. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I was no problem. I was going to talk about the fact that the electric field is. I mean, the visible light is narrow and bend, and you list a few of them, but that's fine. I mean, uh, I think you're you have had enough of those questions already from the previous chapters. Anyway. So I'm going to stop the recording right now.